These images capture the sights of Pocahontas Island, a small land located within the city of Petersburg, Virginia. Although it is in fact a peninsula and not an island, it serves as its own cultural epoch, completely separate from the world around it. This secluded place is most famous for being one of the oldest free black communities in the entire United States. Hidden here is Pocahontas Island and its caretaker whose devotion to preservation heralds the ideas that these men strived for. This is their story. I believe life is about keep it simple. The same streets that my ancestors worked on, walked on, five, six, seven, eight generation, I still walk down it. Some of these houses we have cemeteries in the backyard. The spirits are there. The river itself, to walk down a nature trail, to see a groundhog, to see a snake, to see you can turn towards Colonial Heights here and like he was back in the 17th century. You can, like you can hear a slave running through the underground railroad, coming through the trees, like someone spoke to you that I'm here. This is Mr. Richard Stewart, a lifelong resident of the island. He has dedicated most of his life to not just the physical, but also the cultural preservation of this community. Because of his lifelong passion and dedication to the island, he was given a special honorary title. That was a name that, uh, for his honorary position that started some years ago. I think man John Ray called him the unofficial mayor. Because I had done so much, Senator, Senator Rosalind Dance was mayor of Petersburg, and she did gave me an honorary forever position as the honorary mayor of Pocahontas by proclamation. The elders came to me and said, look here, we'll make sure you don't leave here. They gave me a house to stay in. Gave you a house? Yeah, with no little, little money I paid, won't nothing. They said, we'll never want you to leave here. Because one day, you'll leave Pocahontas. Some of them even on their deathbed. Put that in my hand. You got to protect Pocahontas and make Pocahontas a better day, even on their deathbed, Mr. John. Though humans have lived on the island for thousands of years, our story begins with the arrival of the Western Europeans. If you go back to, into primitive day, there's evidence of life in the discovery of 65. 100 BC has been discovered here on this island, uh, certain artifacts. But if you want to uh, move forward, when we really uh, became an, a location in reality around 1634, when this Harako County came all the way down to the Appomattox River and called tons of Nake. Doing it back in the day called the regulation. Uh, back in the, uh, if you was free, you had to plant a mulberry tree. That's why we got a mulberry tree on each, most of these lots, Ryan, because that represents... That's a mulberry tree, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that represents freedom. That's a mulberry tree. That's a mulberry tree. Each of these trees are the last remnants of the old property lines. As a boy, Mr. Stewart would play for hours in this field. Today, he now owns the majority of what you see before you. John Bolin, the descendant of Pocahontas, went to the House of Burgess and said, uh-uh, I want this island to be, this island to be named in the honor of my great-great-grandmother because this supposed to have been given to her as a wedding gift. I want to be named Pocahontas. And with him going to the House of Burgess at that time and having a name, it was named Pocahontas in Chesterfield County. John Bowling also established the first major tobacco warehouses in the area. With this new crop came a need for a new kind of labor. There was unlimited freedom gained to a lot of blacks after the Revolutionary War. That's where a lot of my folks got land. So a lot of people throughout the state of Virginia 
who's emancipated from the Revolutionary War that fought for their slave master, left and came here. Because they didn't feel threatened by being here and they could work and, and, and the labor force in Petersburg was needed and they came to Pocahontas and they were free. Pocahontas Island uh, is significant in that it is one of Virginia and by extension America's oldest and earliest free black settlements. A lot of the blacks that lived there, I mean the, the white residents of Petersburg that dominated its economy prior to the Civil War thought they were you know, corralling or exiling the blacks there, but the blacks took it as home. I mean, they, they have considered it as their home from the beginning. And I think that spiritual connection over 200 years to a place where they have basically been able to call their own for that long um, is a wonderful thing. I mean, and it's thriving to this day. Uh, so it's part of the story that is not only historical, but it's current as well. We sat down with Mr. Lewis Mayland, Director of Preservation Services for Preservation of Virginia, an organization he's been with for more than 30 years. We are the oldest uh, statewide historic preservation organization in the country, founded in 1889, and have been active in physical preservation and also working with communities toward preserving their neighborhoods uh, through the last 127 years. But above all else, he is a lifelong resident of Petersburg. It literally was a place we made a journey to. I mean, it was only five, six miles out of town, but, you know, come Saturday morning, that's where we went to shop. Come Sunday morning, that's where we went to go to church. Uh, I ended up later on going to high school at a, you know, just up the road here. So, you know, this is where I came to for education. So it's a place you go to, um, for any number of reasons. For Richard, it's probably something that he understood as a, you know, central to his life. Um, so, you know, Mecca is sort of a catch-all term for that, but it, it's, it, it's something that in, in, uh, indicates a certain uh, respect you know, for the, or reverence even for a place. Feel like you can feel those presences? Wow, so. I can, yes. What does that feel like? Oh, man. You didn't hit something. <laughs> uh, ancient voodoo was practiced here. Christianity was practiced here. From this, where I'm at in life here now, I am still communicating with the past. When I walk the river trails, it's like a spirit speak to me through the trees. At night, like I can see things. Look like I'm protected. You asked me a question, what's it like to live here? Regardless of what went on in Petersburg, or wherever I was at in the world, even when I went to Germany, Norway, Greece, military, no place was like Pocahontas till I got back. I felt I was protected from childhood to manhood. The spirit still protected me. That's how I feel about it. This is the Black History Museum. Established in 2003, this building houses thousands of artifacts from across the centuries. Mr. Stewart both owns and operates the museum. Over the years, he's assembled these treasures with nearly all of them being purchased with his own money, a total sum ranging in the tens of thousands. Uh, Mr. Stewart, I understand that you're a photographer? Yes, sir. And you took these pictures, right? Mm-hmm. What are these pictures of? Like, which ones? Each picture reflects our history and our culture. Well, the first one is Isaac Jefferson. Isaac Jefferson is one of Thomas Jefferson's slaves that came here in the 1820s after Mr. Jefferson's death. He stayed until he died. He was part of the bowling. He had saw Pocahontas on the way to Williamsburg with the Heming family and saw this as being the promised land. While many of these objects have an aura of majesty about them, there are a select few that may give some pause as to their inclusion. So there's a lot of stuff that have to deal with the clan and yeah. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And some people 
would say, why would you keep something like this in a, in a museum? Why would this sort of stuff be displayed? What, why do you feel like it's important to display? This? Do you realize that most of this stuff I got, my white friends gave it to me? Yeah. They wanted me and said, Richard, put this in your museum and let people know of the past. Mm. If you don't know your past, you're bound to repeat it. A lot of things they gave me for uh, correspondence, how you can join, but we blocked hot, hot, what do you call it, a hotline number. Hot I, even here, a friend of mine from Northern Virginia sent me an old paper and told other people was hung in Petersburg. Uh, John Forbes, June 11, 1889, and in Poria, the Cardin people. These folks send me these things, and most of them that I got this stuff from is white friends of mine. Do they ever, um, I'm trying to think of the right, right way to say, do they ever, how like sensitively do they approach, do they approach you or do they just give it to you and say you need to put this in here or do they say like, uh, well I'm not sure if you want this, but. Yeah, that's it. A lot of them are very hesitant about bringing the memorabilia like this back here. But a lot of them trust in me because I go from different places to lecture. I lecture about black confederate, I lecture about so forth and so on, but they don't got confidence in me that I would display this in the museum, but I would not carry it out in public. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. Just for the museum only. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Okay. Mm. And all of these pictures are from real... The real, real things that happen throughout America. Community isn't just a collection of houses. It's also um, uh, an identity. I'm Cassandra Newby Alexander. I'm a professor of history at Norfolk State University and the director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for African Diaspora Studies. How did you first get started in history? Like, what drew you to it? Uh, I had a very circuitous route to get to history. I've always loved history in my family background. I've, I would listen to stories, especially from my father's mother, talking about her family and hearing about how my grandmother and her family got chased out of Abbeville, South Carolina by the Klan in 1907 because they were trying to teach African Americans how to read. And so I, I, I suppose I had an interest in history, listening to those stories and and my mother called me an elephant because she claimed I never forgot anything and I remembered things even as far back as a year and a half. Her passion for learning and drive for discovery eventually led her to being introduced to the story of Pocahontas Island. I have been there briefly uh, many years ago and, um, and I've always been fascinated anyway by that area, that General Richmond Petersburg area because uh, it, it, it occupies a, a, a space that I guess you could consider to be a hub. Having worked so much in academia, Professor Newby Alexander has some special reservations about some of the claims certain others have made about the island over the years. I think it's very important to be as accurate as possible when you make claims of being the first or the only, or the oldest. I think that um, relativist terms are actually better to use, one of the oldest. And that's why I think it's always important to not say something definitively. 
when there are question marks, when you don't have that proverbial smoking gun. Is that why you may have not an issue, but like a slight reservation when you see signs that say the oldest free black community in the United States posted on the island and stuff uh, like that? Absolutely. Um, in part because in Virginia, um, the first settlements uh, that you would see of English people and then English and African people was further into Hampton Roads as opposed to in the Richmond area. Yet most of what we perceive in history is in reality stories. Betsy Ross didn't design the first U.S. flag. George Washington never cut down a cherry tree. And the sailor kissing the nurse on BJ Day did not know her, nor did he have her consent before doing so. Yet the aura around these stories are so in which for many, it is better to live within the realm of legend rather than reality. So to live in Pocahontas and they selling slavery, slaves only about less than a mile away from it. You heard slaves, they say on, on a clear day, you could hear them being whipped and even down on the Appomattox River, there were slaves down there and free Negroes on Pocahontas Island. So to live here with the freedom we had, it was a gift from God. That's why we always felt like we, this was the promised land. And a lot of slaves ran away from throughout Virginia just to get a taste of the promised land. So having a space, an actual space that people can go to is important. That's why you have monuments, so that people can gather at those monuments and they retell a story. And African Americans have done that. Um, and that's a, a part of human history. Human beings have always had these spaces, these gathering places that uh, allow them an opportunity to retell a story. And, and that's what makes um, um, history interesting when you don't have the proverbial smoking gun telling you exactly why something is the case. And a lot of stories come out as a result of that. Um, some myth, some uh, with some grain of truth in it. Um, it's but hard to find that grain of truth yes. sometimes, isn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. And do you think that that's just as, maybe if not more important, than just reading a, a textbook with just dates, but to actually have a recording of those oral traditions passed down from one oh, yeah. to another? Yeah, it's, it is so true. A young lady came by the other day there and she asked questions, but same as they did back in 1937, the WPA Act. Some people going around recording the last of the slaves. And if they wouldn't have done that, I got the book, Last of the Slaves, How They Saw Slavery, that would have been gone. And I think it's so important now that a lot of these villages and different things like this, they need to record folks. I am what you call uh, from the World War II, two, 1940s. We have fallen like flies, you know. You need to recall the history in each locality. Each village has its own history. It's not in the book. And each village's history is different from another It village. is. Each village's history is different. It's different. It is. And it'll never be in a book. In 1831, in Southampton, Virginia, a slave by the name of Nat Turner lived. Heavily influenced by the Bible, Turner began to set in motion an act that would lead into the new phase of all blacks living across the South. After Nat Turner, he reinterpreted religion. See, he reinterpreted religion. No one before Nat Turner never saw a role as a black man in religion. Um, and set, um, left the, board of Re the book of Revelation that defined a man with white woolly hair and brown skin. And, but Nat Turner saw, took that Bible and said, if Moses can do it, God's going to give me the power to do it. And I'm going to walk in Jerusalem just like John. Now, Petersburg, he was hoping 
that free Negro from Petersburg, Norfolk, and all that joined him. But they never did it. They never did it. Why do you think that they didn't do it? Uh, because of strenuous uh, uh, fear and intimidation. After interpreting a solar eclipse as a divine message, he led a group of 70 plus slaves in a campaign of violence which resulted in dozens of men, women, and children being murdered. In his museum, Mr. Stewart shows us a physical remnant of this period in time. These are slave shackles here. 18th century slave shack for Big Bubble. Hey, $5,000 if you want to buy a pair now. That's what they cost. This represents the suffering of the black folks, the black slave that suffered on the Appomattox River only less than three quarters of a mile away from here, how they were shackled. Also, Ned Turner, did you help us? Did you hurt us? Now, for the man in bondage, and you stayed in there another 30 plus years after you, Ned Turner. I don't know. But these here represent slavery, but this here for to represent you. This is what Ned Turner killed a lot of his master and kids with. They chopped them up with what you call a broad axe. That's what this is. Knowing what those were used for and all the, the horrible things that have happened with them, how does that make you feel when you're holding them, knowing the history of what those were used for? When I feel the spirit of yesterday, it hurts. It hurts to know what they went through. I have read the articles about slavery on the Appomattox. Down in this area, some of them tried to escape and come into Pocahontas, and they put them snails around the neck. But with me, preserving Pocahontas and the spirits of yesterday is still here and I can tell a story of suffering, I believe I'm accommodating what they want. That's my belief. But that's these things that make me feel sad, very sad, that the, that the arm prints of some slave is inside these shackles. The rebellion began on August 22nd, 1831. Within 72 hours, their forces were crushed due to an overwhelming force from militias supported by U.S. artillery fire. Mr. Stewart shows us a list of those involved with the rebellion. He has a list of them. Free Negro, children, about either you was acquitted, you was hung, or you was transported out of the state. It wanted to see free blacks, not the Turner Revolt, but the whites in control wanted to use that, that rebellion as a way of dealing with the growing presence of free blacks. Do they know the aftermath and start to celebrate the horror of that Turner? How did it affect the free Negro in the state of Virginia and in Southampton? It hurt us more than it helped us. Even though Ned Turner's slave revolts are based upon his, he was inspired by the Bible, but the aftermath, we were once again put in the same category as a slave, a free Negro. For every one slave master and children Ned Turner killed, if you go from the Mississippi to Louisiana, to North Carolina, Virginia, and throughout the eastern seaboard, the eastern coast, probably you got more than five black, blacks was killed for every one person or even more. There in Southampton, you probably hundreds of people was killed there. Even we lost our reputation here in Pocahontas as a, well, more or less, the white man get along with us. That's what I said. They didn't trust us any longer, and they watched us. 
they placed restriction. A certain time we could not go out in the street. The black codes was in force. They watched us. You could not have a gun. You could not do anything. The aftermath of Nat Turner need to be taught. It lasted more than Nat Turner might have, slave revolt might have lasted less than 30 days. But for nearly 30 plus years, until the Emancipation Proclamation, we suffered. There was a tremendous fear that all these free blacks in Virginia would be a problem, that they would destabilize the slave system. And so they decided to use that as a way of helping to change that. Keep in mind also, Southampton County had the largest percentage-wise of free blacks than any place else in the country. So there was a, a rhyme to, you know, a reason to their, to their actions. Uh, they wanted to stop free blacks from learning how to read and write. So they passed a law closing down all schools for free blacks, even though not a single free black was even remotely accused of being involved in the revolt. But they used that as an excuse to deal with what they considered to be a big security issue. What happened after Nat Turner? A lot of your whites among us started to relocate towards the mountain, towards Charlottesville, Gordonsville, and so forth. A lot of them left here because they felt there was a terrorist among them. So a lot of them. It turned neighbors against neighbors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You didn't know who to trust. So a lot of people left here. And then, at then, it really builds up, vice versa. A lot of blacks moved in here after Ned Turner because retaliation was throughout the state of Virginia and so forth. So a lot of them flopped in here. And that is when we became majority over here in Polk County. As Pocahontas Island continued to live in freedom, Thousands of others continued to live in bondage all around them. However, the residents seeing this injustice did what they could. According to local lore, they became a major fixture for the Underground Railroad. You have to understand the route of the Underground Railroad. Petersburg living in the most commercial district, what do you have? You got railroad, you got waterway, you got highway, all right? Where do most of your rivers pass? A plantation. Where most of your railroad tracks pass? A plantation. Most of your slaves, maybe they didn't know where they was at, but they followed the river. And the river brought them right towards Pocahontas. These unexceptional looking homes were in fact key destinations in the Underground Railroad. For many, they became an important refuge in their pilgrimage northward, a pilgrimage towards the fundamental human right of freedom. Um, most of the people that have been documented left aboard a ship 
Um, the chances were far greater that you would be successful if you left aboard a ship. Um, it would take less time. Okay. What they did, they organized what they're going to carry them and they built what you call a false bottom in the boat. They built boats with certain people because remember now, the Irishmen and so forth and so on, they were both, and they would take them and put them down and build a floor and cross. And that's how we was able to take them from the Appomattox River to the James River to the York River on out to Chesapeake. This was the number one, the waterway was the number one highway out of here. And because of the people that lived among us made us very successful. No one had ever been captured leaving Pocahontas. It was so effective. You know, I had been hearing a few rumors about that, but it wasn't until I was contacted by the Washington Post reporter um, that I really started um, uh, reading up on the efforts by Mr. Stewart to preserve that land and to talk about this being a space for the Underground Railroad. Um, and that caused me to go back and look at a lot of the documents I have collected over the years on the Underground Railroad, and I said, oh, don't remember seeing any references to this, but I'll go back and check. Um, and I thought, well, maybe they don't make a reference to the island per se, but maybe there's a, a reference to some of the people who lived on that island or the space. Um, and, but in Petersburg, free blacks lived in a variety of places. Uh, while they were localized, of course, to the downtown area, that was not seen as the downtown area. And so it, it, it opens the door for the possibility, but I haven't actually seen the definitive explanation, not, well, not definitive explanation, but the definitive documents that suggest that maybe that actually happened in that space. This is the entrance to the secret basement of the house on Witten Street. The story goes, this is where escaping slaves would seek refuge. The fireplace is built directly underneath another one, so that the smoke and noise would not draw attention. And the house across the street was built by a white man, but it was for a uh, commercial purpose. But black folks lived there, the Browns and the Williams and Sarah, so therefore, that was called, when you couldn't hide them above the ground, you hide them in the ground, but they have a cellar in there, had three floors, camouflage, you would never know there's a, a floor beneath the house. The story about the, um, the cellar and, the, um, and the, the fireplace underneath one of the houses, uh, actually the first thing I thought about was the prohibition period because a number of my colleagues who have looked at the Underground Railroad in a lot of northern areas, you know, so you have Ohio and then you have all the northern areas and everybody claims that their house or this house is, is part of the Underground Railroad. And so um, what they found was that many of them uh, were used during prohibition, that a lot of these sellers were actually, and tunnels were actually there for prohibition as, you know, secreting the liquor as opposed to existing prior to that. So my first thought is do an archeological dig, see how old that space is, see how old the, the fireplace is, that will be a first clue because not always are you, you going to have, and especially with the Underground Railroad, not always are you going to have our um, documents to prove anything. It's hard to say about the Underground Railroad. It came through here because of most of us are all history. And if you look at, if you ever read about history of Richmond, look at how West Summit slaves ran. They ran towards Petersburg. Why did they come towards Petersburg? It was easy out of the Appomattox River and probably going out to James. And it couldn't go to the mountains, you know, so something about Petersburg, it was easy to leave Petersburg. And, and where are they gonna camouflage you at? Where are you gonna sleep at at night? Um, the South was a police state during the period of slavery. And this is what people don't understand. You did not have the right to speak out against that. Think about the story of the Keziah. 
In 1858, the schooner Keziah was secretly smuggling five slaves to freedom via the Underground Railroad. According to local lore, the men boarded the ship from Pocahontas Island. Well, everything uh, went as planned. But as his captain was sailing out the Appomattox River, he got stuck on a sand barge. And getting stuck on a sand barge, he couldn't get it off. And when the inspectors came down and inspected, they discovered a way how we were running the Underground Railroad. What we did, false bottoms and boats. William Bayless and his shipmate uh, Simpkins and those five enslaved people were, when they were brought to Petersburg, there were thousands of people that waited, and they were, of course, white, waited for them. They were screaming that they should be lynched, that they should be killed, that they should be destroyed in some way. Imagine the, the furor that they were facing from these mobs that could at any point in time overpower the um, police force that was supposed to be protecting them and at least give them uh, the opportunity to, to, have, um, um, to have a trial. Mm -hmm. um, and so this kind of environment was very hostile uh, to anyone. I mean, in, in the minds of the mob, they were guilty until proven innocent. Did that change how you operated the Underground Railroad around here after that? That sort of changed, changed a little bit, how we op operate the Underground Railroad, but we, uh, we always had a certain means. If you See, one thing you never heard people talk about, why do they call it Underground Railroad? Anybody ever thought about why they call it the Underground Railroad? We ain't had no Underground Railroad. So we had subways in New York, and that wasn't back there during the day. How this thing came about, they did pick a slave sitting on back of a, a train going into Canada under the baller. Now, if you look at most plantations, what runs by most plantations? Railroads and rivers. So a lot of your slaves started to escape through railroad and all that kind of stuff. Tied them on the bottom of, 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 of rail cars, uh, understanding how it was. So a lot of your your slaves escaped from the Underground Railroad by railroad. A lot of the message, you take a lot of the slaves that worked on the railroad, told, gave message about what was going on. Like they, when they hit, it won't be long, I'll be gone, and all this. They actually told a message when they were working on a railroad. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> yeah. Actually working on that railroad, that's what a lot of your songs came from. Tell old John, won't be long, we be going on home, look out. Yeah, that's what it's all about. <laughs> like a message hidden in plain sight. Uh, that's right, a message. Just like down on that river there, they would say that you could tell when a movement was gonna go. When they started singing, won't be long, so I be gone. Swing low, cherry yo. Oh Joe, getting out here. They would t actually t they pick a message was in the song of when the railroad, underground railroad was in movement. They tell them, it tells you the song. It written in the song. <laughs> so a popular story in the 1990s was that African Americans use quilts to not only uh, give signals about the Underground Railroad, whether it was safe to flee or what, uh, whatever, where to meet, uh, what the path was, and that people would be putting these quilts out telling these stories. And I remember going to an Underground Railroad conference and in early 2000 and asking some of my colleagues, what is this all about? I've never heard of this particular story. And they didn't know either. I had never uncovered any reference to any quilts ever in all the research I had done. And, um, and I should say it was maybe in the mid-1990s, early 2000 that that came out. Because this was about in 2005, 2006, I was at a conference where we were talking about this. And about a year or two later, uh, one of my colleagues published an article really uncovering the myth that it started out 
by this author as a children's story. And then it became popular, and then there was this exhibit, this traveling exhibit, debut at the Smithsonian, <laughs> a big book, full colored, all these things, and it was all a lie. Um, and, and, I, and I still encounter a lot of people who have heard about and believe the, the quilt myth. But the, the issue about the Underground Railroad is that if you did something all the time and the same way, people would see. Petersburg in the antebellum period had about 4,000 people who were black in that city. And there were a lot of whites in that city who did not want their property to, to leave. That meant, in some of their cases, that meant the difference between poverty and wealth, between being able to eat and not being able to eat. And so they, they held on to their slaves um, with all their might. And, and so the issue really is that if somebody is leaving, uh, all the documents show that whites had, the cities hired night watchmen. They invested a lot of money in trying to ensure that those enslaved people did not leave. So there was so much effort, there was so much money invested in trying to make sure that these enslaved people did not leave. That if you had one location... Yeah, if, if they heard rumors that they're always helping free yes, blacks escape, yes. then they would... And especially in areas where free blacks concentrated, they were under surveillance all the time. Someone told me years ago that the night has a thousand eyes. How many eyes does the daytime have? And so when you think that people see a lot, even at night, and especially in small towns or small cities or communities, um, there can't be a lot of things happening at the same time or in the same way without, it, uh, um, uh, without some suspicion emerging that maybe these individuals are guilty. When I'm close to them places and I own some of the properties, it still feel like it's the rite of passage to me that I'm still running on the Grand Railroad of history. We are still discovering the Underground Railroad through history. I, my museum is in the route of the Underground Railroad. It's a rite of passage. They have told me, you got to look out. I am, this is my responsibility, what I'm doing right now. I was chosen to do this. In 1861, three bulls, says I. In 1861, three bulls, says I. In 1861, we licked the Yankees at Bull Run. And we'll all drink stone blind, Johnny, come fill a bowl. April 12th, 1861. Confederate guns fire on Fort Sumter. The war had come. Charles Tinsley, one of our people among us, because they had told us, E.G. with us against us, he stood in front of the courthouse and he pledged our allegiance to the mayor towns, towns of the city of Petersburg, that we will serve you in any capacity that you wanted. And the community pledged their allegiance to us that they would take care of our families and everything while you're away. And they did that. Now, after a period of time, they wore us down. It's old saying they wore you down. They got such thinning in the ranks and servitude, they locked our women up overnight and wouldn't let them come home. And one of the songs the women used to sing as they came out of there, Johnny, do you love me now? That's why women used to sing. And we, that's why we served them. That's why they believe that this is our 40 acres over here in the center while we still got it. There's no indication that anybody ever come over here to try to take our land. 
And we believe it's all because the walls, especially the Civil War, was with the South and they didn't take our land. Through a mistake we lost Bull Run three bulls, says I. Through a mistake we lost Bull Run three bulls, says I. Through a mistake we lost Bull Run and we all skedaddled to Washington. And we'll all drink stone blind. Johnny, come fill the bowl. Neither side had wanted it, but the first battle was at hand. And man or boy, Johnny Reb or Billy Yank, each soldier faced his own worst moments alone, waiting. The Black Coast of Virginia that tells you black people's right from the 16th century all the way up until the 19th century. A lot of people ask the question, why did we serve in the Confederates? Because the ordinance required us to. Almost the same ordinance required us to serve in the Revolutionary War applied to the Civil War. If you were dying here, you either be a part of us or get the hell out of here. In 1864, the rebels had enough of the war, and we'll all drink stone blind, Johnny come fill the bowl. The war could not go on much longer. Grant besieged Petersburg, and with Sherman's cavalry joining him, forced Lee to abandon his capital. It is April 3rd, 1865. One thing that you talked about was the silence at mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. And you say that you see things. Mm -hmm. What do you see? The ghosts of the past. If you are walking down the street, something will come and meet you. And when you get there, it's not there. I believe that so much death and destruction was on this island through both wars, the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. A lot of the dead soldiers that never went home is wandering on here. For an example, this was the gateway to death from the Petersburg, at Richmond Petersburg Railroad that brought dead bodies in from the Manassas and so forth. And some of them got off a train and wandered in here. I believe that Native American spirit still hunt this place. And once there was an Indian burying ground here, I believe my folks still surround me. You can be walking down the street according to our, our history, and I believe it. There's a spirit that something will come by you and you feel like you're freezing. But yet, in that instant, you get hot. The river itself, where they beat slaves to death, drowned them and killed them. That spirit walk is out. And I feel I can feel him and see him. The war was now over and all men free by law. Yet, as with most traumatic experiences, a deep scar was left, one we are still facing today. I have actually heard some psychologists and sociologists describe what African Americans are generally enduring as post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, for example, for most young African-American men. And, and just as an anecdotal way, I query my, my students. But I ask them, how many have been stopped by police? How many of you have been stopped? How many of you have, have uh, been stopped and you feel as if they were just harassing you? And what's and the response that they give? The response is almost 100%. Um, and I ask my nephews the same question. It's almost, it's 100%. There's a denial, a constant denial by our society 
about uh, what many African Americans, especially males, have to endure, and um, and the constant harassment. Uh, you walk into a store and someone follows you around, and. So there's always the supposition that you're the villain, that you are the potential criminal, um, that you're not given the same kinds of, of um, courtesies and considerations that whites would get because there's a failure to acknowledge white privilege. There's a failure to acknowledge whiteness and how that was established as the foundation of this country so that if you are a citizen, it automatically means you're white. But you cannot blame certain people when the crime is in the area and all that kind of stuff. You need a better life. If we want to defeat post-traumatic stress of slavery, let's take back our black neighborhoods. Make them Pocahontas. I could have left here. Pocahontas is pretty to me, but some people's got, got to leave. So there are a lot of things in our society that we deny, and those facts seem to get pushed to the side in favor of a very selective argument, rationalization, that stems back all the way to the 18th century and the pro-slavery argument and is really embodied in what I see as Thomas Jefferson's one contribution that should be forgotten. And that is his argument in his notes on the state of Virginia in 1785 that blacks are inferior, whether they're inferior by, by birth or, or by condition, it doesn't matter. The bottom line is they're inferior to whites both in body and in mind and I'm paraphrasing as opposed to quoting. That is at the heart of American culture. Give me liberty or give me death, Patrick Henry. You was talking about a three cent tax on tea in the, in the Boston Harbor, wherever you was at. Give me liberty or give me death, but you didn't give up your slaves. Mr. Jefferson, the founding father. When you had the chance to do something. You said no more slave ships come to America after 1808. Now, three fifths of America. What I'm saying now, when the Civil War was over and you was economically deprived for two or three hundred years, how do you catch up? You're behind in the race two or three hundred years. How do you catch up? But there was two post-traumatic stress out there. You had the poor white man, overseer. There was no provision made for the poor white man and the black man. That's what the Ku Klux Klan came about. No provision. Now, your question was, disparity between income and education in America, you'll never catch up. Right now, parts of Virginia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, North Carolina, Florida, mountains, there's generational poverty and despair that would never catch up because of the post-traumatic stress of slavery. The issues being discussed here are complex with no easy answer. That being said, a comprehensive coverage of this sensitive subject is outside the intended realms or scope of this project. If there is one final thought to say on this, it may well be this. Another thing, we as black and white have to sit down and talk how we can get a better world. I don't care if you white or if you black, poverty hurts. I don't care if you white or you black, illiteracy hurts. And if you don't get some help, you can't get out of that hole. Over the next century, the island rose and fell with the times. The steel industry dried up in the early 1900s, causing many residents, especially young people, to move away. World War I saw another huge depletion in the island's youth and future. 
But much like before, the community endured. It is here in the early 1960s, Mr. Stewart's life began, perhaps by destiny, to be tied into the island. I felt unwanted by history. There was a thing, and if you were related to Sally Hemming, Betty Hemming, towards Jefferson, it looked like your history didn't have no meaning. That's where we fell over here. Well, then I didn't realize, even though I heard it, but they always talk about other free Negroes, other free this and free that and so forth. I did not realize how rich my history was till I went to Richmond. And I went into the library in Richmond and people helped me. I think when I went to Washington, D.C., August 1963, that when Martin Luther King was there. I had a sister that lived on the corner of 14th Street and Gerard. Listen, there was a song by The Temptation, Runaway Child, Running Wild. You got to go back home where you belong. And when I got in Washington, D.C., that's what I felt. I was a runaway child, running wild. I got there, and the city was too big. Cars all night long, people stand on the corner. Taxi cab, ambulance, policemen. I got to go back home where I belong. A uh, master storyteller is a person who has the gift for telling. Well, you ever heard of something they call a guru, a guru in Africa? Mm -hmm. I was informed, I was very involved in Liberia, Africa once. And there was a guy who did the storytelling uh, about his history. He told me, work on it, work on it become a master storyteller of my people's history and I would prosper. And that has been true. So I have learned so much about our history and older peoples in this area pass history on to me. That's the duty, to pass it. It's generation to generation, pass it on and on and on. So I, from a child until they died, they told me the history. And I remember, that's a master storyteller. I heard a saying once that, it, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, mm -hmm. it went like, when a storyteller passes away, it's like a library burning down. Do you w worse that? than that. How is it? How's that worse than that? It's unrecorded history. They will never be told. Right now, you, you, my daughter should be here. That young lady should be here. There's things that I know you won't find in a book about the hills of Colonial Heights, how the Civil War was fought up there, lynching in Petersburg, culture. I know it, it's been told to me from childhood. There's in no book about things, and that's it just the way it is, just like on this island here. Religion on this island. One of our prominent religion on this island was voodoo. You get what I'm saying? You don't hear nobody talk about voodoo now. So what I'm saying is that if I don't tell how it operated, from my perspective, no one knows. Voodoo. In 1971, the city council rezoned parts of the island for new use in industrial development. Seemingly overnight, Businesses began to set up shop, many without permission from local residents or even via unauthorized land purchases. As far as I'm familiar with it, um, yes, Roper uh, Lumber Company is probably the largest installation that was built there. In fact, the, the business has since closed, but the, the site is still there. And Pocahontas Island has had a long history of residential use. It was a port in its early days when the uh, river was navigable, but it was always residential. People have always lived there, especially the free black community. So they became very protective of that island. And as it became more commercialized, there was a bit of a backlash against that. So when you look at what people want, Pocahontas is a beautiful place, looking across that river and all that kind of stuff. But they, once you get them in, you can't get them out. Believe me. 
it's a valuable piece of real estate. I mean, it's, it, it's accessible from the land, but it is more or less an island. Um, you know, so I, I think they maybe have a justifiable concern that other people are eyeing their space and not necessarily to become part of the community, but to change the community. The rise in living costs became so great, families could not maintain an upkeep and nearly 250 people were threatened with the very real possibility of imminent domain. Neighborhoods torn down and taken away, including the very house Mr. Stewart was born in. The city of Petersburg had a person on that wanted to zone Pocahontas commercial house. They wanted to the whole island Roper Brothers. They wanted to get rid of us. We could not improve our houses. We could not do nothing. Nothing to the houses. Even though the house that I, they gave me was show up house and so forth. We had, but other people could not make repair on the property. I think that that was their way of trying to sneakily get them out without like ruling in a court of law. Oh, absolutely. That. We would see the same thing happen in a lot of places. Virginia Beach did the same thing where there were constraints put on um, expanding your, your home or modernizing your home where you had to, in order to do that, you had to bring in the water and sewage and pay the thousands the tens of thousands of dollars to do that and people could not afford to do that. So they would sell their land, the city then would appropriate the monies to construct this and then the developers would build this housing. So yes, I, I think that there was definitely a push to uh, use the law to push people out. And it's not just blacks that they do that to, it's anybody whenever there's a piece whenever of land that's that coveted. Land, yes, yes. They get that, uh backdoor politics. Yes, going. yes. So how do you feel when you look out and you see all that property that was torn down and now there's just a bunch of big empty factories that no one even uses anymore? First thing, I was born on that side of the street. That's where I was born at, 154 Pocahontas Street. All that was residential ones. And what had happened, a lady owned that property and a man named Davis Mr. Roper was able to buy that property and told us, it's okay, we're not going to move. He said, he's not going to move us out of there. The flood of 1972, he was down on the lowland. He decided he was coming up on the highland, and he told them how it was down. Now, you said how I feel about it. Now, I went to city council last, about two weeks ago, and I spoke about the black property that exit 52. When you come off of that, why do we have to encounter that type of uh, light property in Old Town when Old Town is the most beautiful part of Petersburg and that's the worst looking part of Petersburg at the front door of Pocahontas. This is what remains of the Roper Brothers Lumber Factory. Today it sits alone, derelict and abandoned. Four years after the initial move-in, the residents won a victory. The city ruled that due to the island being a historical district, no new commercial structures could be built. But by doing so, they could no longer afford the upkeep necessary to maintain their properties. These are images you may never forget. As you can see behind me, the destruction is just terrible down here. This Flip cars and rip roofs right off buildings. Without a doubt, one of the most extreme storms to hit Central Virginia in a long time. Distance the cranes as construction crews and power crews continue to work in that area. A cluster of severe thunderstorms spawns the powerful multiple vortex F4 tornado. It hits Petersburg first, damaging more than half the buildings in Old Town. Shortly before noon on August 6th, 1993, a Class 4 tornado struck the center commonwealth of Virginia. Before subsiding, it caused the deaths of four people and more than $50 million in property damage. It was the most devastating tornado in recorded Virginia history. Oh, so I have a train coming to the building, and I'm not, when I 
stood up, I looked down from the third floor, and you could see the roof just peeling off. The truck picked up off the ground, and all of a sudden it dropped back down, and, and that's, it was that's, that, that quick. While not present on that day, Mr. Malone remembers the incident vividly. As a matter of fact, we had our, our first mobile phone. We were on a, a trip up in Charlottesville, and we were thinking, what a wonderful tool this is. And the, one of the first calls we got was, oh, by the way, our tornado just hit Petersburg, and it collapsed the, the three of the four chimneys on this building. Um, so we, that was on a Friday. We came down here the next morning, but the city was, I mean, the, this part of the city was cordoned off. We couldn't even get to this building to assess the damage. It was like almost, I guess, three days before they would allow us in to see what happened. On Pocahontas Island, 62 homes and the community church had either been destroyed or damaged. Homes which had stood since the 1700s, gone in an instant. Debris from a nearby storage facility was hurled across the bridge, blocking the only route off the island. For days, the storm-ravaged residents were trapped, unable to leave, nor was any rescue effort able to gain access. It's just amazing. I mean, you, you see on TV or you hear about natural disasters that strike a wide area. But until you really stand there and see it, it it's almost incomprehensible, the, the level of, of, I guess, personal reaction or understanding of, of what a wide-scale catastrophe is, is totally different when you're in the middle of it rather than just watching it on TV or, or reading about it in the paper. Terror of terror. When that storm came through here and then destroyed Pocahontas and went right on to the Walmart and killed four people. As this thing was said, we just pray it. We just pray it. That's all we could do here in Pocahontas when the storm came through. We just pray it when one of one. God blessed us. Three died in Twister, but here in Pocahontas, we didn't have a single person die. Is this, of all these different headlines, Reign of Terror, uh -huh. Power Signs, is this the most significant one to you? This is the most significant one here in this one because Doug Waller, the CD, first black governor of Virginia to come here and say he was going to give us help. And with his kindness, with his kindness, that we believe that him and other patriotic people, as I said, came here and put us back together again. But we just prayed, and God answered our prayer. That's what we believe. Terrell. The bedroom just exploded. That would happen. It just exploded. Obviously, you were here that day, but did you remember looking out and actually seeing? I was not here. Oh, you weren't here? I was. If I wouldn't, if I wouldn't have been at work, I'd have got killed. It had killed me because the tornado came through, and and right there where the bed I was sleeping in, all the glass just went <clears throat> in the bed. And I'd have got, I, I, I went back to work because I had to go to a, a, a little celebration. If I would have stayed at home, it would have killed me. Do you think that that was another sign that God was looking out for you? I believe it. Day? I believe it. I've been dead on that day, but they sent me away to come back here. I've been dead on that day. Came right through. You feel the breeze now? Mm -hmm. At August the 6th, at 1.30, at 200 miles. Right on. That house affected. That's a new house was built. That house was refurbished. All they refurbished. That house was rebuilt. It destroyed everything. Right there. Went on through that. Yep. Uh, Pocahontas, a lot of the a lot of the buildings there were just demolished. I mean, they they had been collapsed to the point that they were just removed as debris. Uh, where I think they're down to like 52 structures there now, where there were you know close to 100 before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it was a much more devastating impact to them than it was. I mean, our, our loss was financial. Theirs was, you know, life-altering. They would not leave the South Sacred Land. Some of them stayed here and almost slept in a tent till it worked on the house. They would not leave. Do you think that there was a fear among 
it's the mindset of people living here that if they did, they wouldn't be allowed back in, that they would say that this is like too degraded for you to live in. Let me explain to you. When this tornado came in here, they found out some of those deeds hadn't been changed in 100 plus years. They never was changed. People died, they still were living there. A lot of them figured that through legality, they won't lose their houses. A lot of them figured that they're going to come up with some anger to, to take their houses. So they stayed here and washed the house, setting chairs and so forth. They wouldn't leave. I myself never left. That's another thing I'll tell you again. When that tornado came through here and destroyed all that property, I had limit, I had mild damage compared to other things around me fell, but my house withstood the storm. I stayed here. That's, that's one thing that I've heard in researching about this tornado, mm -hmm. that they really seem to only focus about like the devastation that happened afterward and they try to make it sound like there was this big tragedy and everyone lost everything, but from the way you're telling it is that that actually brought the community together. And that's not the story. The greatest person. thing that ever happened when that tornado came through Pocahontas, God sent that tornado through here, the path. It was guided by God. It came through here 200 miles per hour, August 6, 1993. See, when a tornado hit water, it get power. So when she came through Old Town, boom, 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 and when it hit that water, it speeded up. But look at it now. It came across the Appomattox, and Roper Brothers had a commercial warehouse that destroyed that. It came to that petroleum place down there and stopped and went down the street and came around it. It went around it and came around it back. Didn't touch it. It went in where the chapel at and destroyed the old termite chapel and went right straight across there and destroyed the old regular car lot we had went on across the river. You gonna tell me that God didn't guide that tornado? Mm -mm. Now, people who have never been able to afford a house, if you own your house, if you regard if you make less than twenty eight thousand, they rebuild your house and do some people got brand new houses that could never afford it and a lot of people's houses was updated that could never done it. God save Pocahontas. It, it takes a long time to recover from something like that. I mean, this, this is not an area that's prone to tornadoes, so it was kind of unexpected. Uh, but now when a cloud comes up in the summer, you know, you sort of look at it a little bit differently than you would before. Where do you think Pocahontas Island would be right now? It'll be gone. i will be Shantytown. Most of the people living over here didn't have money to develop their uh, houses, either through HUD, uh, indoor plumbing, they could have got improvement. Before the tornado came through here, we had outdoor toilet. Some of these houses had outdoor toilet. Had outdoors toilet. But after the tornado came, everything was updated. Mm -hmm. What was your, can you remember the first time you met Mr. Richard Stewart? I, it actually was in the context of the endangered sites announcement. We wanted to reassure him that it was not a negative. We were looking at this as, you know, hopefully a way to bring more attention to the island. And we weren't certainly not casting any aspersions on his stewardship of the island or his interest in the island that we were wanted to be partners in that and uh, tried to make him you know, feel a little bit more comfortable about Because, you know, to say something is endangered, as you talked earlier with the endangered species, sometimes that's not a positive thing. And, you know, I guess in the strict dictionary definition, it's not. But what it's meant to convey is that this is important and that, you know, we, it, we may lose this. So, you know, let's pay attention. Let's see what we can do. And so when you're trying, when you have someone trying to preserve a space so that 
the memory of some of what these people endured and what they were able to create for themselves um, is in many ways sacred because it's not generally respected. It hasn't been respected by our larger community. And there's been no effort to ensure that those spaces um, receive special attention. I think that what she had in Pocahontas is so sacred. See, Pocahontas is not only black history, it's white history too. Whites was here before the blacks got here. The Bolins, the Robins, the, it was just, they was here. Then we came. This was their homeland. But it's seen that God blessed us and made this our promised land. Now, there's one among you. This is what black folks believe. There's one among you that's one day going to lead y'all to the promised land. There's one among you. But our Moses is bold among us, and we're here on our promised land. And one day he will rise. He'll maintain the promised land. I'm Moses. I'm that man that they nurtured as a child and told us the story of Pocahontas. I am that man that, look, In 2012, the residents were approached with a kind of dilemma they hadn't formally faced. The proposed construction of a historically based theme park to be called American Dreams. The park was the brainchild of Mr. Marvin T. Broyhill, a lifelong resident of Petersburg, but not the island itself. I heard those rumors too, and we were somewhat concerned about the authenticity of any type of um, presentation that would make. Plus, anything of that scale would likely have necessitated the removal of a good deal of the existing historic stock there, which, you know, to remove actual history, to put in a little bit more presentational history, uh, is not something that we would... down an old house in order to like a ticket booth exactly it. right yeah that, that type of trade-off is not something that we as preservationists would endorse I mean, the way they were saying everything was going to be around us how can everything be around us and don't involve us imagine if you will all what lay before you gone in its place, a vast parking lot and ticket booths filled with lines of impatient tourists. Where once there were neighborhoods, now there are trolley cars, horse-drawn carriages, even a cotton candy vendor or two. Had you heard that in 2012 someone had tried to build a historical themed theme park around Pocahontas Island? <laughs> had you heard that story? I have. That was about the same time they wanted to do something in Manassas and yeah, yeah. What is your opinion on the idea of going into a place whether there is a large amount of history or not, or just an older community that was so central to one group of people, and then building, you know, Ferris wheels and trolley cars and stuff on it, tearing down older buildings so they can put up newer attractions. What is your kind of take on that sort of thing? Horrified. I'm absolutely horrified because we have enough false history, false narratives. People already don't know the difference between a lie and a fact. I think it's really important that we not make history an entertainment venture because entertainment is all about selling something. 
and history is about uncovering what happened. Um, and there are many perspectives on what happened. Um, you think of the story of the blind men studying the elephant. Um, so there are all these different pieces that historians try to pull together to see a larger picture. But those kind of places want to sell you a certain story that yes. is approved by them, for right. them, for right. you to consume. Exactly. And so any time um, truth becomes a consumer activity, it's going to corrupt it. Um, industry is not coming back. I mean, it, it, you know, unless it's a very different industry, it's not going to be the mass employer that it was 30 years ago. Uh, with the population that passes through here, with the population of people that come to Fort Lee, which is only about six, seven miles away from here, if we can have a vibrant restaurant, entertainment, you know, fun place to visit, reputation and opportunities, I think that can. It may not carry the city to the level that a, uh, an industry would, but it's what's available and what should be taken advantage of in every respect. And, and history and preservation can and should be the key to that. What do you, would you feel the, kind of, the people who live in these kind of communities would go through if these kind of attractions would start to be built up and put in in all these different kind of places? Oh, I think the people couldn't afford to live there because it would change the property values. And, and what historical value was there would probably be destroyed. They were relying on the same type of traffic on 95 that we talked about earlier. You know, there's tens of thousands of people driving by there every day and if they can see, you know, Ferris wheels and roller coasters and all that, even if they do have colonial themes, they're going to get off and, and look at it, but that's not real history. You can't recreate real history. What a lot of cities have done is they've created historic trails so that people can follow those trails. Um, uh, not quite the Pokemon Go scenario, but you know, they, they would GPS the trail and and here on your on your uh, mobile device you can read about it and, and you can follow that trail and and maybe hear some narratives of what was happening that's that's more respective of of the privacy and the integrity of that narrative that takes place um, is as the moment you make something an attraction you change the complexion of that uh, place and that space. In life, there are two sides to every story. However, we were unable to speak with Mr. Broyhill to get his views of his vision because he passed away in early March 2016. In a way, I do feel sympathy for his cause. His intentions were certainly admirable and his dreams grand yet they were not dreams the world was willing to embrace. For better or worse, Mr. Broyhill lived and died without ever seeing his dreams come to fruition. Do you feel like these people were trying to basically turn, as, as far as an attraction, turn the people into an attraction of Pocahontas Island, like turn it into maybe some sort of like a human zoo where people would just come and stare and then they would just go and leave after that. That may not be the best. I, I, I believe that that is, has a lot of significant thoughts about it. When that tornado came through the year 1993, we were not reported. They said Old Town and South Park. When they flew across, the who are them down there? This is old black community down there. And people came down and interviewed us like we was a lost tribe.
In recent months, Mr. Stewart began to notice damage to a number of the buildings and properties he manages the upkeep for. When it became an issue, um, I guess I have about four houses over here. I'd go in between. And the historical house ran on the corner, built back in the, the late uh, 1800. I was around doing some work then. I noticed there was dust spreading over the prop and so forth, but I never thought about it. And then one day I observed and found that these trucks coming in was spraying dirt all over my property and everything, etc. I wound up having to put a roof on one of my houses, and I, I never thought about it. So then I started monitoring the, the trucks and found out there was a lot of trucks coming in. I went to city council. I went to city council and I told them about it and what was going on and et cetera, et cetera. And I told them that once was cobblestone. That was cobblestone uh, street that ran. And y'all had put uh, crushed rocks on that. And the weight of the trucks had crushed the rocks down and caused dust. This is a sample of the debris Mr. Stewart collected in the wake of just one single truck. During our time spent on the island, we saw no less than two dozen massive trucks thunder their way across the small community. These hulking metal beasts crushing asunder the land so many dared to dream of while in bondage. And you were the one who put those signs over by the house that yes. said... Yes, some, some friends of mine. There, there were some advocates that came in here and said, Mr. Stewart, let's bring attention to this, what's happening, yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you think that, I remember we spoke on the phone and you said the situation had gotten a little bit better. Do yes, you sir. Do you think that that helped the situation, bringing I, that attention I to I think it? that really helped because they wound up putting a sort of a, a payment on it. Then the thing now, they were they have a Sabbath curfew. Trucks was coming any time the night, any time the day, and now the smaller trucks can come from six to eight at night, and the, and the large truck from seven to six. And it looked like they tried to abide by that. Um, do you consider that a major personal victory to get those curfews there to make sure that the trucks aren't throwing things all over the place all the time? I don't. I guess I don't associate accomplishment with victory. I, I look at it as being my job in Pocahontas. They call me an honorary mayor, the unofficial mayor, and cetera, and people really looks up to me, and I try to do the best I can to protect the community. So when you see that community accomplishment, when you come together as a community and try to affect change, and you see a, a positive change, what does that make you feel once that change has started to be in there? Uh, there's a song by Sam Cooke, Change Is Gonna Come. I felt when I was a child, I used to think about that song, and now I see change is gonna come. And what I'm doing right now, I figure that this is a change gonna come in Pocahontas. This is the birth of our 21st century that I'm doing now. But I'm very leery about uh, the future of it. This is the oldest standing structure on Pocahontas Island, the Jarrett House, built circa 1820. According to folklore, it was used in the Underground Railroad. Across the street, a vacant lot sits. Just a few months ago, a house stood, now demolished and hauled away. Mr. Stewart says that older homes will often fall at a rate of around one a year. At that rate, he estimates, 
most, if not all, of these structures will be gone within a seven-year period. On the day our camera visited with Mr. Stewart, we stopped by the Petersburg Visitor Center only to discover that that day would be the last day that these sites would be open to the public. We were granted the honor of being given the last guided tour inside them, but were denied permission to film inside at the time. Standing inside these celebrated landmarks, an idea becomes clear. Though so many people claim to value historic markers, why are we so willing to let it fall into disrepair and eventual decay? It doesn't affect me one way or the other. I own this. I get no support from the city of Petersburg. This is my private museum. Now over there, they get paid. You know, very little money come in here. But this museum in Petersburg Battlefield can still go on. Pamplin Park. It's just the museums in Petersburg. Now how I feel about it, I don't feel that the history of, of Petersburg should be untold. That's part of, uh, uh, of uh, more or less what you call it, bringing people in to the city. Yeah, that the, the greatest diamond in the rough is our tourism. That would bring people in here to see things. Petersburg is so rich in civil war Revolutionary War, even the War of 1812, the cockade that we got that name, the War of 1812. So it's our history. So how can we survive? Now, I was at city council, they say they're trying to contract out the places. So I believe they can get enough volunteer people around here to run that museum. A uh, city without their history is lost until they find it. That's my belief. Our first thing, I think it's going to look like a jungle. I cut a lot of grass over here, my John Deere. I think people can become so independent of my property. And I don't think what had happened to Pocahontas over the years probably have been left to women, they've lost it. I got a daughter. They can own it, but the maintenance of it, get them. That Pocahontas Street over where Roper Brothers, that most of them belong, used to belong to women. Come. You don't realize how much property over here that I cut the grass. And we're going to look like a jungle, then the city going to labor, it can be, they'll be gone. And fruitful life. Um because he is a wonderful and, and unfortunately somewhat unique individual in that he is you know, able and willing to put as much of his time and resources into that. I mean, you hope the next generation will step up and, and do that? I have to do it, as long as I can. But your question is, once I turn it over to my daughter, I don't have no faith in her. She said, Daddy, I got it. I don't see it. I got a friend of mine, I'm gonna give I, I got it, but it's more to it than just saying, I got it. But turning it over to the females of tomorrow, I don't have that much trust in them. I don't. Maybe I'm wrong for saying it, but I don't. I've seen it happen. The street, the West, I know who owned that land. I once lived over there. It's all was sold to the Mercy District, on the corner down there. We own all that. And the women sold it because they could not maintain it. And that's how they got the land. You really love and are committed to what you're doing, you know, you'll, you'll find the resources to do it. Um, and I've seen this happen, you know, in 35 years across the state where people who brought a house back or a site back or an area back unfortunately pass on and some cases their kids or other parts of the next generation step up 
some cases not. I mean, it, it's <coughs> unfortunately it takes a lot of personal dedication. Uh, I know one particular woman who served on our board for years and years and years and was really uh, integral to the organization. And when she got to the point where she was no longer physically able to do it, her kids actually told us that, you know, our mother gave more time to you guys than she did to us. I think that where people have lived and a lot of people, it kind of leaves a feeling, an image, almost some sort of marker. And, and you, a place sometimes feels old or it, it feels it feels like it's filled up with life and energy. Um, but also sometimes it feels forgotten. There's a sadness because it reminds me of a place that's been forgotten. And yet life was there and people accomplish great things. And so remembering those places I think is very important. It, the, the, the real question, the real trick is how do you want to remember that place? And what are the ways that would give honor to that place? How do you then remember it? How do you put up reminders and whether it's signs or museums or whatever to try to capture the essence of what that place represented? That's always the trick and the struggle. I look my ancestors in the face and say, I'll be okay. I'm that man. Let's hear that, honestly. Let's hear I am the man. Moses. Ash, you talked about all the spirits of the past still being here and still being felt and present here on the island. Do you think that when you do eventually pass away, that your spirit will also be here. I, I would island. roam. I would roam this island with spirits wherever I'm at. I stand God on this this island when I die. If there's such thing I'm coming back, I'm never gonna leave here. They're gonna they're gonna carry my remains out here, but my spirit will always be here. Like my ancestors are still here right now. They see you, 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 you know, right now, they're here. And then, look, now let's think about it. Y'all are history. Who ever thought that a man came from the bootstraps of nothing, that I'd be here one day talking to my white brothers and white black brother about Pocahontas. And I'm very thankful that y'all are here and that my spirit sent y'all here. I, had, I saw you in my dream. I knew you was coming. I know that sounds crazy, but I no, saw you in my dream. Did you, did you remember? Like, huh? Did you feel like your ancestors? Like, was, was, when you say you dreamed that we were coming? I dreamed one day y'all be coming. I saw y'all standing in the street. I saw y'all communicating. I saw you. I saw y'all. Like you saw our faces? Yeah. Whoa. That's why I asked you a question this day about who were you? Yeah. I saw y'all in my dream that y'all was coming. Even last night I recycled y'all after you called me. And they said, okay. I'm talking to you because I passed, y'all have passed the interview of the past. My spirit says, it's all right to talk to y'all. If you could say one thing to your past self when you first started out, what would you say? Oh gosh. Wow, that's hard to say. I don't know. Take more pictures to remind yourselves, I guess, because things do, even in historic area, things change, um, and you just want to fix those memories somehow and, and, and remember that experience because it's, you know, it's fleeting. And it, if, if you don't capture all of it, that's what's such a wonderful thing about film and, and photography and all of that is that it brings back the sense of what that day was like. Um, and that's a good thing. Archaeological evidence may contradict some of the things that you believe, but then there's always another aspect of that story, and that's true of all oral accounts. It's that nugget of truth 
may be clouded in all kinds of folklore and mystery and so forth, but there's still that nugget. And that nugget is really important to understand. And so I think that the story of Pocahontas Island has really yet to be uncovered. This has been a great day. I thank y'all for coming. My people say you always come. Whatever you I said, whatever you have filmed, I've spoken the truth. And I've spoken the truth to y'all, and I want y'all to produce the truth. If there are any questions, tell them call me, and I'll straighten it up. And I appreciate y'all to the fullest. And I wish that more people like y'all would come and share my moment. I appreciate my history. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I thank y'all.